So good afternoon, and that's, it's good that we still can meet under the roof, following the general sanitary inspector of Poland. Probably the next our meeting should be on outdoors, for the meetings indoors will be completely closed. But this is the, after all, a biology institute, so I believe that they should have if someone has the antivirus protection shields, then they, they are clearly operating here, right? But anyway, um, actually I realized that there is a solution to the virus. Uh, let, let me make a few comments about it. On our first lecture, we, we were talking about the allometric law that there, is a, there are, in biology, there are relations between important variables, and they go all over the sizes of the species, and they are a power law. And uh, I, I took the data published by some European Commission uh, concerning how many cases are in Europe, and uh, how many tests have been performed in Europe. And it looks like these two quantities are, of course, related to each other. If, if you have a larger number of tests performed, you have a larger number of people who are sick. And I tried to check it with data from Poland. And we also have, well, we have still very little testers compared to, say, South Korea or, or Singapore. And, um, and it turns out that they are very proportional. So uh, you, roughly one can estimate how many people will eventually be found sick in Poland. And that's not a terrible big number uh, before we run out of tests. And then, then the thing is solved. But then if, if any one of you is interested in uh, biological statistics or something like this, and uh, probably at the end of my talk, I will use this as an example of some calculation. There are now published data from Singapore. And the, the Singapore is, of course, authoritarian country. So they are not subject to this famous law, which in Poland is called RODO, that you are not allowed to hang the list of inhabitants of a given building because you have to protect their privacy, irrespective of the fact that they are all publishing the very secret information on the Facebook or Instagram. That is, but no, no, you are not allowed to, 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 to put the names on doors or something like this. And anyway, the, the, so Singapore has relatively easy way of finding, really pinpointing who, who sold the virus to whom. And this is a remarkable drawing. Namely, there were basically six cases, six initially cases in the whole Singapore. And they have a complete map how this was growing. And it's incredible. I mean, there is a one branch, the one place from where this whole business started was some kind of Eastern Asiatic church. I have no focus idea what kind of church it was. The other is a company which delivers the, 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 this box dinners. This is also very popular now in Warsaw. You can order the box food and you will get the full day meals delivered to your home. And there, there are a few others. And um, the, you look what is happening. There were several people who got sick. And then there is a one branch which is a family. And that family was clearly recognized as sick and put up in the hospital, or uh, I mean, this is not on this drawing, either hospital or in the, in the quarantine in other uh, homes. And bingo, this stops here. No, nothing is there. And there is a single individual who keep going, 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 and you seek a complete tree of, uh, of this. And that shows that really, truly, this old-fashioned epidemic uh, tricks played since the time of uh, Black Death in the, in the Middle Ages, they work. 
that's the only way it seems to me to stop the. Uh, by the way, the, this will be the next, the second in Poland large uh, epidemic, so to say. Uh, the, we had before the war, after the after the war with Russia in the 20s, we had a cholera, a giant cholera epidemic on the east south of Poland, and that was solved also by by a local doctor with the name Dr. Gatch, who simply closed everything there. He simply put up the army and closed the whole, uh, whole area for a half a year and so, and then, I mean, we, the number of casualties has never been published, but that was solved. All right. But that's biology as well, so now we can talk about our, what happened. We stopped by talking about the, the fact that the human body is, and the animal body in general, is built such that it uses enormously large forces to allow the, our an animal body to do some useful work. And this is because the uh, biology chooses speed in favor of the force, and uh, what actually is worth to remember from all that I have shown you is that the uh, bones and muscles form a structure of levers in our body, and then there are these this number characterizing levers, which is called the mechanical quality or advantage, and that the that number determines the a speed, also the speed with which the given structure, bone and muscle can move, and we looked it up on the case of lifting a certain weight. And how large, how, how actually, why the nature chooses the, the, to operate with such enormous internal forces is remarkable, because when there is a force and something moves, then there is a phenomenon which is in physics is called dissipation. Namely, if you are applying a force, you are also doing some work. And the, in order to do some work, you have to spend some energy. And there is no free lunch. And if you want to do some work, you have to spend much more energy because there are some laws of physics which are usually called laws of thermodynamics and we will talk shortly about it, and these laws tell us that if you are spending energy, some of it must be lost. There is just no way to do some work without losing some energy, and that lost energy is what used to be called in the 18th and 19th century heat, and is still called heat in the common language, and th there is a lot of internal heat generated in the human body due to the fact that these enormous forces do some work. And uh, what is remarkable is that how the biology can dissipate this energy, that we are not being heated up to the very high temperature. And of course, I'm not yet prepared about the proteins. So I, I don't know what is the temperature at which the protein chain melts, but you, you know it much better than I. But uh, we have to prevent our uh, and animal bodies from heating up to the temperature where something dangerous will happen to the basic structure of our of our uh, of our life, and uh, that is uh, uh, this how the how the biology dissipates that energy is actually a very interesting subject which perhaps we can have some time to discuss. So I would like to stop the static part of my talk about the forces by discussing the uh, by discussing the the uh, uh, let me, let me, by discussing the the case the, can you see yes uh, the case of a hip 
the hip is a very important part. I mean, humans are bipeds. And it is interesting how evolution managed to uh, uh, build up our upper part of body, this elbows, differently than the hips. And animals which walk on the four legs have much more similar structure in the front and the back legs. But our upper and lower dynamics, so to say, of moving limbs is very different. So I will just be talking about the hips. This is a picture. And again, I will map the biological hip into the lever structure. And on the right of the drawing, you have the drawing of a hip. And uh, it is uh, uh, slightly more complicated uh, uh, structure than we discussed with our hand. And uh, I haven't even dare to draw the, all the muscles which are involved. But the most important muscle are those, a bunch of muscles, which actually help this whole thing movable. And uh, that is also the most tricky part of the doctors when they replace the hip by an uh, artificial hip, because artificial hip is actually this part. So they have to somehow to attach the, the muscles to a, a piece of metal, which is a, the, the, the artificial hip is an extremely trivial mechanical device. It consists of a, a bolt which is inserted into this bone and the other bolt which ends up with this semi-spherical head, which is put by force into the socket from which the original bone, human bone, was removed. So this is a purely uh, engineering work uh, and uh, looks like a replacement of the suspension in a car because you also have to put two things together and takes about five hours in case you will need it in the future you should know how much that it's a nice good sleep five hours during, <laughs> during the surgery so that is uh, the thing and we have the leg and in my calculation I will assume that the leg is just a straight piece of lever and the, that is the point on which the total weight of a human body is suspended it's our feet and there is a weight of the bone which is called v w with sub l and it is hanging it is conveniently to attach it to the roughly a middle of the bone slightly below the the knee and experimentally, it is found that this weight WL is proportional to the total weight of a human, and that the factor of the proportionality is slightly less than 0.2. So now we have everything. There are the proper dimensions, and uh, uh, I have to calculate the forces. First, the balance of forces. And there are two interesting forces. That force, which is this when it should act in this muscle business, and the reaction of force, this is a force which acts on the socket. And this is this force, so to say, which causes you the pain if you are sick. Because they, 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 this, is, this is a moving piece of bone moving inside also the other bone. There is some lining there and some grease, natural grease, which lubricates the whole thing. But with the age, the lubrication goes away. And there are some individuals for whom this lubrication is gone completely. And then the, this laying, mm -hmm. which covers the head, the, this head of the bone is gone after a while. And these bones are touching each other. And when the bone touches the other bone, it's extremely painful. And then you have to undergo the, the surgery. So we have to calculate these two forces. And they are related by the balance of forces equation. And there is some trigonometry with these angles here. And then uh, there is another balance of forces. And of course, a torque. Torque on this point must be also equal balance. So 
there are three equations for the three unknowns, like in the case of, the, of our arm, and we can solve it, and that is a solution. And it turns out that both of those forces, the reaction force on the socket of the bone, and the reaction for, and the force of the muscles, which held this whole thing in, in place, they are relatively huge. They are twice, roughly twice, the weight of a human body. So if you put a conventional number that the, that the person weighs 70 kilograms, then we can find out that, for example, this reaction force is almost two kilonewtons. It's a huge force. It's an enormous force. And that is how it is happening. All right. So we, we are basically over with the statics in the mechanics. And now I will, be, I will try to talk about the motion. We know that we are all moving. And uh, what is the first step if you are try to move? You have to stand up. You have to stand up. And if you, we are standing, we are actually moving. The person, an animal, we, when it's standing, it's in, in a permanent motion. This is, and this motion of the standing human or a standing animal it's even more complicated. It's an extremely complicated issue. The point is that we have to stand and our brain continuously have to control our stability. That due to the nature of fluctuation and micro motions in our body, for example, that there is some liquid moving inside your, our intestine system, the position of the of the center of gravity moves inside our body and that changes the stability. And it is important when we are standing that the, that the, that the, that the location, the, 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 the direction, the, the point towards which this force, our, our weight points, will not move out of our feet because we will then fall. So uh, the question is how our what is the dynamics of standing? And that is, the, that is shown on this little cartoon. Then we hardly ever are, it shows some rudimentary kinds of motions of our body when we are standing. And uh, we can measure that. And there are, the people used to measure what is happening when we are standing since 18th century. Now, of course, we can do it with electronics. Uh, the, you, can, you can actually buy in the, in the stores electronic weights nowadays, right? So the, the, there is a very simple thing to convert the electronic weight into a device which will check what is happening with your feet when you are standing. And uh, I even if you are standing on the normal weight, there's this electronic weight, and if you stand for a long time, you will realize that all of a sudden, the digits on the displays are flicking. You are changing weights by standing. And the point is that we are not capable I mean, to, to, to really stand we, we, our position fluctuates, and this is a very simple device to, which was used to measure, namely you wear the belt which is connected to some weight, and when you move, then this belt is, then this weight is moving up and down, and the motions of that weight can be, can be easily uh, observed. And of course, uh, the motion of the belt, how, how up and down it's moving depends on this length of that connection, this wire. So this is the machine. And that is uh, a model of uh, a person who are standing. And it's a very, very crude model. It's a straight individual. Uh, and uh, the it, it has enormous feet, as you see. 
And the point is that the standing is done basically by our feet. And the, what, what, what is interesting from the physics point of view is that if my feet is standing, then the force which is applied by the, by the, by the feet on the floor <coughs> is fluctuating, is changing in time and in position. Our feet is never still. It, it, it does a lot of motion. So uh, this is, for example, uh, on the next on, on drawing, you see the record of what is happening with the distance, with this distance df in time, which is measured. And as you see, it's, it, it fluctuates. So this is very complicated thing. And to describe that motion, it's, uh, it's, it's not the easy task. And I could not resist the temptation to show you at least one mathematical equation in its glory. Uh, this is uh, one of the <coughs> equation describing so-called rubber human. With the human is described as a straight piece of a stiff rubber. And uh, this is an equation for those of you who know a little bit of mathematics. This, this kind of equation are called telegraphic equations. Uh, because they are w describing waves, because we are waving, and it, these waves are damped by uh, of the force of our feet, and such an equation actually describes a propagation, very similar equation, describe the propagation of electromagnetic signals along the wires. And when Lord Kelvin was lying the under ocean wires, uh, for a telegraph connection between Great Britain and the United States, he had to describe the properties of this wire, and he, uh, he found out that he can use a really very relatively simple equation, and that is uh, that kind of an equation. But that was just uh, for fun. So you will see that in the physics we, we also have a complicated uh, equation. All right. So, in order to give you a glimpse how interesting is, is, uh, is, a, is a physics of motion of animals, I would like to talk about the walking. We, 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 we know that this is a complication with standing, so what about the walking? And before I start doing some extremely simple analysis, which will give us remarkable results, it turns out from the very simple analysis, we can get very good estimate of, of uh, properties of human walking. Uh, I like to, I, I have to actually, to remind you a, a story about the pendulum. A pendulum is in physics a rope on which a bob is suspended and which moves. The first description of such a phenomena was is historically attributed to Galileo Galilei, who went to some church in Florence and so and have noticed that there is a lamp which is moving back and forth, and he calculated the period of this motion, oscillation of that lamp, as history say, using his own pulse. Since the human pulse is what? Well, for healthy people, this is about 60, 70 cycles per second, per minute. So that was a slowly hanging lamp. Anyway, the, the, the theory of a pendulum is a complicated story, depending on it, what constraints are you put on it. If you allow this pendulum to move over the hang, over the top up suspension on the top, it allows it to go all the way or not. But if you uh, restrict your description to the motion of a pendulum when the angle of deflection is very small, then things are very elementary. And the equations which describe the motion of the pendulum are some kind of a holy grail of the physics. They are mathematically equivalent to object which is called harmonic oscillator. And harmonic oscillator is really something which is everywhere. 
Ah, we are sitting in that hall and you are, I'm using the computer, you are listening to the, my voice amplified by the speaker and you have in your pocket a smartphone which is connected to the outer world and we are immersed in this room into the, a sea of electromagnetic radiation because we have, I, I mean, the, the, we have a projectors and we have this I'm surprised that the Institute of Biology still uses those kinds of lamps. How come that this is permitted? This, these are, they, they contain mercury. They should be banned. They are, this is very unhealthy. Anyway. But removing this will, you know, it's free mercury in the atmosphere. They replace it by the lead lamps? I mean, all, all this fluorescent lamp contains enormous amount of mercury. When the European Commission banned uh, thermometers and also banned the normal lamps, and initially there were no lead lamps, there were only this idiotic fluorescent lamps, right? They, they claimed that they banned the thermometers because there is uh, too much mercury in the environment, and uh, they, they, they put up considerable more of mercury by those lamps for, because after all the thermometer mercury is very useful when it breaks you can use this as a toy when I was a child like you, I had a little box of matches we I mean after my the matches were thrown away and I had my precious mercury and, uh, and that's that's fantastic I mean you can do so many things with we, uh, and also, I mean, we, the physics building in Warsaw, the Institute of Physics of Warsaw University, was historical on the Hoxha Street in Warsaw. It, we moved out of it somewhere close here on Pastera, and that building on the Hoxha Street was given to some humanity, the British, English language department or whatever. And they are not aware of much that in the, in the labs there are under the floor. There is a continuous layer of the mercury because, I mean, there were kilograms of mercury which, was, which were spilled all over the place in the Institute of Physics. And in order to remove it, you have to turn the building down, essentially. And it's historic building, so you can't do this. So, so anyway. Anyway, so the, we are the harmonic oscillators. The small vibrations of the pendulum are extremely important. In, in physics, and then there are there are a few things which you should have remembered from the high school. First is what is the period of the oscillation of a pendulum, and the period of oscillation of pendulum which is one over the frequency. And now comes a comment in physics and in many books, uh, frequency is used in a different sense. In two, I mean, it's always the same physical quantity. But it depends whether it measures in the radians or it measures in the angles. And the difference is by the factor of 2 pi. So, I'm, uh, I mean, in, at my age, I only can understand radians. So, this is the, the, the real expression. And then the period is a 2 pi times a square root of length of the, of the pendulum divided by g. And that is formula, which, as you see, does not depend on the weight of the pendulum. And that is because of this, this small vibration. So this is called mathematical pendulum. And also, there is nowhere a weight of the rope which suspends the bob. And therefore, this is a, a tremendous simplification. And the other quantity, which is occasionally good to remember, is the maximum acceleration of the, of, the, of the pendulum, which is proportional to the amplitude of the, of the motion and to the square of the, uh, to the, square of the, of the frequency. So that is the expression for mathematical pendulum. And it's important to remember that its frequency depends on square root of the length. All right. So let's now think about the person who is walking. And uh, 
this is very complicated. So let's assume that this is a sort of a weightless person, that the, on the, the whole weight of the person is in that person's legs. So we have a third, we have a, 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 our hip in which the leg is suspended, that's this red point, and our leg moves in the, that hip. And if we forget about the knee and motion of the feet and something, then the motion of a leg looks slightly like a pendulum. So I will first describe the motion about assuming that this is like a pendulum. But of course the length has a certain weight, so we cannot neglect the weight of the leg in the analysis. And now if I again picture it in the terms of my levers or bars, then the walking has been reduced to the oscillation of that kind of object, a heavy bar, which moves and since we, we usually do not make a very long steps, right? So the approximation that there are small angles is pretty good. And the only problem is that I have to use the theory of a pendulum, which is called the physical pendulum, that is this one which has a weight of the rope. And then I have to, then there is a branch of physics which our students are being put through the pains of it during the first semester and they have to calculate the quantities which are called the moments of inertia and that is given here and then the period of the physical pendulum has a slightly different formula but again it looks like it depends on a square root of the of the length and if I substitute there this expression and uh, 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 the, if, if I assume that the, that the, that the weight of the leg, that, that the knee is roughly in the middle of the, of the length, then the period of, the, of that kind of oscillation of that length, of that leg, is 2 pi times a square root, and it again a square root of length divided by the gravity acceleration, but there is only numerical factor which is different. So again, a period. So all this bumbo jumbo that this pendulum is not mathematical is, is in some sense unnecessary because it's only a numerical factor, two thirds. But the dependence is again on the square root of the length. So, the mass of the human is gone. So for all the, all the humans of all possible sizes, Mr. Gortat and you are walking with the same speed, which is only given by the length of your legs. So if you now remember last time you were watching uh, the Olympic Games, you will notice that all those runners, they have a, they, they are good because they have a long legs, right? And that is the, that is the, uh, the point. So we have found that the, and the speed of walking is of course a length divided by, the, by time. So it's very easy to calculate that speed and it turns out that the speed is proportional to the square root of L. All right, so when my model of the walking is, is as a pendulum is okay, then we conclude that the velocity of walking is a certain coefficient which depends on the model we use and the square root of L. The square root of L is L to the power one half. So that is allometric law. We found, and there is nowhere a weight of the object, so it's universal. 
is universal for all the animals because there is a universal coefficient in front of it. But that's not the only model of walking. The other model of walking comes from the uh, a publication by a certain experts in human biology, Mr. Neil Alexander, and this is the following model. Again, we have the completely weightless individual, and we have a rigid leg, and we make a following observation. Independently of whether I am making a short or long steps, this is what happening when I'm walking with a stiff, with a rigid leg. I'm moving up because my, the height of, the, of my hip moves up when I'm moving forward because the height is related to the length of my leg by a simple trigonometry of that angle. And of course, the, uh, the one of the this length is always shorter than the leg, my leg length. So I have to move up, and then when my leg, on which have moved, becomes become behind me, I'm going down. So basically, my hip is moving on a circle, on a piece of a circle with the red, with the with the radius m. And then it keeps going and keep going and keep going. So the speed with which I am moving is just the velocity of a point moving on a circle on the top of the circle. That is easy to calculate in physics because we have the following situation. We have a gravity, we have a length, and we have a circle. All right, so we remember again from the high school that acceleration of the point moving on a circle is related to the square root of a velocity and inversely proportional to the length. So that acceleration has to be always smaller than the gravity acceleration because otherwise if on the top of my on, on the top of that circle this fictitious circle it will be larger then the human person will become airborne will overcome the gravity acceleration so we get not the equation for the acceleration but we get the inequality we know that acceleration must be slightly less than gravity so I can turn it for a velocity because acceleration is the square of velocity and then I find out that the velocity is bingo. Again, a universal function of a square root of L. So even independently of the model, that speed becomes a proportion to the square root of L. And using this, I can calculate the numbers and the velocity by that formula is slightly less than three meters per second. So we have from that very simple equations and as what we used to call in physics qualitative analysis, we have derived, we have, we have predicted a property. We have a predicted that the speed is not larger than three meters per second. All right, so that's allometric law. And it turns out that it's, it's completely universal, uh, independent of the model. That is for all, for example, uh, we have the people who are these race walkers, right? And it, it is found experimentally that the good high-speed high walker can they, they, they walk not faster than four meters per second. That's not very different from three meters per second. The difference is a 25%. For such a quantitative 
estimate, that's not, uh, that's not particularly bad. And this drawing shows you what the professional walkers do in order to walk a little bit faster than in the prediction of Alexander model. Remember that the acceleration was, the, was inversely proportional to the length. So if the length of, of, of the length of the leg, if the length of the leg was shorter, then it was larger. And what they do, they walk in such a curious way that the moving leg, they lower the hip. And in lowering the hip, they make the leg which is doing that particular step slightly shorter. This is probably very unhealthy, that kind of walking, but who cares about the health? in the professional sport, no, probably nobody. So that, that estimate was very good. And you know, this is, I, I, I'm giving you this uh, examples, not, even not so much as that you will remember the frequency of the pendulum, but in order to convince you that the physics is good in, pre in making predictions, combining qualitative and quantitative analysis together. That is basically the only branch of science which completely amalgamated the quantitative and qualitative description of nature. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. So that's why riding on the bicycle is easier than walking because we don't have to rise up. Uh, uh, no, because on a bicycle, is, I don't know whether it's easier, but the bicycle motion is completely independent of a human body. It's related. It's rather the point that, <sighs> that you have the gear in between, which is not a human body. I was thinking about that. It's easier to go on a bike because you are turning a bigger wheel against a smaller wheel. And you have this little gearbox in the middle. So that's that's completely different story. Okay. Actually, it's not clear why do we, we, why we can ride on the bike. The question, the stability of the bike is, 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 is pretty complicated. If you are interested in the bike, there was a British chemist, Mr. Johns, who in the 90s steered some kind of excitement because he published in the American Physical Society has a semi-popular journal for, for professionals, which is called Physics Today. And he published a paper in Physics Today with the title, uh, A Theory of an Unrideable Bicycle. And he, the question is, what keeps you in a position on a bike? The constant... Uh, uh, that, there are lots of theories on it. There is even there was even a, a Russian American engineer with name Timoshenko who had published an equation of a bicycle, but uh, it doesn't work. It's 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 it, it has an inherent instability in it. But the, one of the theories is that there is a moment of inertia of a front wheel, which stabilizes you. That likes, works like a gyroscope and keeps you moving. So Mr. Jones tried it by making a bicycle. Uh, there was a definition of a bicycle. It has to have two wheels, and the first wheel is being steered, and, you, and the chain is to the back wheel. That's why the engineer at the Institute of Physical Polish Academy of Science, who manufacture a new kind of a bicycle, his device cannot be called bicycle because it, the front wheel is driven. But it's remarkable remarkable device and he is using it every day to come to work it's still it's still alive that's remarkable <laughs> the, the the so mr johns made the bicycle with the front wheel which had which actually was consisting of two wheels one which was the normal wheel and the other was a slightly smaller radius so it was not touching the ground and was slightly heavy, so its moment of inertia was exactly the moment of a first, but by a, some little tr mechanical trick, when the bicycle was going forward, this additional wheel was turning backward. So there was no effective uh, moment of inertia applied to the front wheel, and still it was possible to ride. 
and it, it turns out that there is this angle, he claimed, that there is this angle of the, of the fork on the front wheel. We, and the relation of that angle with respect to the uh, axle of the, of the front wheel is what, what makes, in his analysis, r rideable bike. But that's the other people are questioning. So anyway, that's not the human. That's not the biological. That's completely engineering. All right. So now we are true with the, with the, with the, with the walking. So now I will spend some short time on discussing with you uh, enormously important from the view of a living structures problem. This is energy consumption of the motion. And I would bring you some concepts by analyzing a simple toy. Uh, I'm familiar with the toy because I purchased that bouncer for my grandchildren and uh, they can spend arbitrary amount of time jumping up and forth. So there is the rubber band and you can jump up and down. And um, what is then happening? You have a person with a certain weight which is jumping at a certain height in the earth gravity and the work which has to be performed in order to jump to the height H which I called A, capital A for the German word Arbeit. It, it's <laughs> because a weight is a weight and in English work is work. So I couldn't use the same letter for <laughs> two things. So I have to use some other link. And uh, this, is the, this is the work which you do by jumping on the height H. And if you are doing some work, then you have to use the energy to perform that work. And in the living structure, the only way it gets this energy is by food. Uh, by food, I mean here a very general concept, right? I mean, we are getting a food. I mean, if you are jumping, uh, well, if, if you have small kids, you try them, keep them away from these energetic fluids. We, I mean, which are in every store, so they drink the orange juice, right? But they, they have to provide some kind of a food. And, and they... Air. What? And air, because you can't get energy from Yeah, yeah, well, air, air, is, air is... Yes, you are right. But air is in something sense a, subs a necessary thing to burn this whole thing. So the balance of air, I mean, we are not consuming air. The amount of air we are using is then converted in various things, but it sits in. We, 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 we are not converting air to oxygen into energy. We are only using it to process of burning himself. That's how Mr. Lavoisier had found it, right? And uh, the, there is an oxygen. By the way, uh, Lavoisier was executed during the French Revolution, but it's not true what is written in the books that it was because of his chemistry. He was a, he was a, uh, he was a tax collector, and he cheated people on the tax collection. And when they had the opportunity to, to guillotine him, that of course they didn't. <laughs> But that has nothing to do had nothing to do with the with the with the, with the chemistry. Anyway, so we, we have to eat some food, consume some food, some products, then we produce some energy, and then we have to use the work. And as I said before, <coughs> there is always some work, some energy which is being lost. So not the whole energy we get in we can convert it into the work. And experimentally, the work of in bi the biologists claim that the work which we can do is usually less than 20% of the energy which we have available for it. So it takes five times more energy to do the work. So the model, the model is simple. We have a person uh, which is with a weight of 70 kilograms, which jumps by 0.6 meters. Uh, 
and is doing one jump for a second by 10 minutes. That is roughly usual. Uh, if, you, if you go to the, the fair where they have these rubber things to jump, you usually pay for five minutes. So the trick is that after 10 minutes, you are so exhausted, you, you cannot jump anymore. But after five minutes, there is a still a chance that, they can, that the child can convince a parents to buy another ticket. So that they, they, they knew very well. I don't know where they, they knew the numbers, but they knew how how, 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 get, how get twice the, the, the ticket. So anyway, this is my, the problem. So I can calculate the work. The work is 400, about the 400 joules. And uh, therefore, the total energy consumption is uh, uh, the work for uh, one jump times number of jumps and times uh, time factor five. So it's about 290 kilocalories. I convert it into the kilocalories because the food people always measure the energy in kilocalories. And so I would like to compare it with something, and this uh, is a, a, a very famous Polish sweet a cookie called Pomczek. It's actually an intelligently made donut, uh, because in donut, as you know, is, by the way, it's a, it's a tremendous difference in the symmetry. Donut is having different topology than the Pomczek, because the donut has a hole inside, and uh, what is inside of a ponchek is the most important part of it, which is a high quality fruit jam. So this is a ponchek and that's the contents of the ponchek. And um, uh, this is actually a, a ponchek made by a company, Angie Blickle. Uh, and Angie Blickle is a mathematician and information science professor who inherited the company. And, uh, and uh, that's an interesting story. And the, the 70 grams ponchek, which, is a, which you got in a, in, a, in, a, in a quality cafe or stores, weights about 70 grams, and it has roughly the same energy which you have to spend. And the 100 grams, which, is in the, which you buy in the supermarket, is larger, considerably larger, and it, of course, has, a, has a more energy. So you have to eat one ponchek, or otherwise you have to jump for a, uh, for ten minutes up and down on this on this battle, as they call it, in order to burn one ponchek. So you, you see that we are burning a lot of energy. So now is another example. It's by walking, uh, and. Uh, uh, Again, we have a person with the weight uh, 70 kilograms, which is um, the, 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 which walks with the velocity three meters per second, and uh, his leg has a mass 70, uh, 10 kilograms, and we know that the muscle efficiency is 20 percent, and that person run for one hour. So the work to accelerate the leg is according to laws of mechanics, one, one half of the mass of a leg times the velocity square. And, uh, and uh, this is to accelerate. And then there is a work to decelerate the leg. So the total work per step is without the factor one half. And then the total energy per second is that about a thousand uh, kilocalories per hour. So walking is very good. So walk, walking for an hour with the speed three meters per second is about four pontrick. That's our numbers. Probably that's not all what is being, what you have to include in the energy balance, but that should give you a feeling that the energy balance of any activity in biology can also be uh, calculated. And now comes uh, a difficult point, uh, what we have to discuss, namely uh, uh, that, there are that I was asked 
that what sh what I'm planning for the exams. And usually there is always a possibility of having a conventional exam. And I am not a big fan of exams. I think that they are obsolete, some the idea. So in the course of my, of my lecture, I will show you a few topics which I think are good topics for examination, which I use it very often, that the individuals take one of those topics and then they have a very short presentation. We devoted one or two lectures at the end when I am sitting comfortably in the chair and you are talking and your only duty is to talk such a way that I will not fall asleep. And, uh, the, and uh, the, the, so these are, this is a list of few, few, few topics to discuss which would allow you uh, to think about it. One is a running on a curved track. The people run on a curved track and then you have to have this, all these fictitious forces which are in the, in, in, a, in, a, in the motion of a curved tracks into the uh, more, more detailed analysis of running and there are some suggestions what to run even in the New York Times had recently an uh, 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 interesting paper on it this was in January 21st <coughs> namely I didn't know that there are uh, uh, there are performers Perform. I mean, there are some people who are happy with the sport, namely humans running on four feet. And uh, this, this, this is a story describing what are the achievements, how fast they can run, and what are the world records, and so forth. And there are some indications there how the physics of that uh, looks. Uh, look. I understand that they want to eventually run so fast that they can be airborne like the horses, but, but nobody has done it so far. And there is the very thorough analysis in Journal of Applied Physiology with, uh, about that thing. All right, so we, we are moving into a new chapter we are finished basically with mechanics and as you see we, we cover actually all the first semester of the of the physics statics and dynamics and uh, as you see this all can be applied and of course can be applied in the in a more complicated fashion we can write the differential equations and so forth but uh, uh, if we do a very complicated analysis uh, with the walking, you will find uh, the same. We, we, I had a PhD student, uh, Nguyen Huang, from Vietnam, who is now a big professor at the University of Hanoi, and uh, uh, we, 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 we play a, li a lot of with the, with the some kind of algebraical method of solving complicated problems, and one of the problems was actually a problem in uh, in 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 uh, in human dynamics, and I had somewhere the picture. Uh, this is the picture. Uh, we built up a, a model uh, of a human, which is a 13 weights connected by a proper bonds, and each of these points had a weight, and each of the bonds had a weight and the motion of the, of, of, of the articulation point on this diagram had the uh, friction coefficient, so they simulate the, the forces and so forth. And uh, since the, his PhD thesis was on the, on the algebraic description using some kind of a mathematics, which is called the metriplectic Dirac brackets, and uh, we, we, we derive uh, analytic expression for this motion. And it took such an enormous time on the computer that it was, it turned out to be not really practical, but also the results were essentially the same 
as obtained from a more sophisticated model by this fellow Alexander has more, more, much more complicated models than I have shown you. So we check it. So we can, you can do a lot of work on more complicated things, but more complicated mathematical apparatus, but that's not the essence. I mean, the essence is to understand the physical, physical, uh, All right, uh, so we are now here. We are going now to talk about the other topic. We are going to talk about the fluid dynamics. The important part of living structures is that we are full of water or full of liquids. The yeah, uh, we had the, uh, we have still an exponent in the Copernicus Science Center where you can get on the weight, on the scale, and it pushes into a cylinder, which is in front of you, as much water as is in your body. So there is a lots of water there, and uh, for, 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 for we, we were toying with putting up the label there that this is the amount of water in your body except of your head, in order not to offend the people that they have <coughs> water instead of a brain. That was relevant at the beginning of the center when we have all these officials visiting it, and they were very keen to get on that scale to find out how much water they have. We had a problem with a, with a very distinguished individual in the government there who was a lady and she got very much upset that she has so much water. But that's the way. So we, we are basically a liquid object and it is important to know a little bit about the biology, particularly that we were discussing the motion of humans and uh, and animals, and they are, as you have seen, we describe them by means of a rigid body dynamics. They were levers and points and so forth. But there are a lots of living structures which do not have a bones inside of their body, and they somehow move very quickly and in very different So even from the point of view of the me mechanics of a living structure, we have to know a little bit about the science about the fluid. And in the 21st century, the word fluid is slightly undefined because the conventional definition of a fluid is saying that this is some substance which does not keep its shape. Well, you can, I don't know where you still can go, but if there was a still, they, they, they are closed now, I believe. There were stores called Toy For Us. And in a Toy For Us, you can buy a, 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 a substance which is called Silly Putty. And that is a, this is a piece of something uh, which is sold in a box and the, uh, when you open the box, there is a little ball in it. And you can throw it on the floor and it bounces like a, like a good quality ball. And you can throw it on the wall and it bounces from the wall. But you can leave it on a, on a, on a, on a, in a, you can put it in a glass and put it on a table overnight. And when you come in the morning, it's just a flat, liquid like panel which sits inside. Is it a fluid or it's the solid body? No, it's something something which exists, you can buy it. I don't know, 10 slots is a piece or something. And, uh, and in some cases you have to describe it as a fluid and in some other cases. But basically you have to understand that the depth, the, that the liquid is something which does not have its shape. And in addition, 
there are liquids which are being called Newtonian liquids or fluids and non-Newtonian fluids. And Newtonian fluids are those which are described in the conventional textbooks, and non-Newtonian fluids are those who, which are not described in the conventional physics textbooks. The problem is that the non-Newtonian <coughs> fluids are extremely important. Who, who, who of you had ever had in, been in touch with the, with the non-Newtonian fluid? Yes? What kind? The holy type. Uh, well, that's true also. Blood. The human blood is non-Newtonian fluid. <laughs> And uh, uh, many liquids in our body are non-Newtonian, but and basically non-Newtonian and Newtonian dis distinction is that Newtonian fluids have the parameters which describe them like viscosity. We will be talking what is the viscosity to next week. And the viscosity is a number. But for non-Newtonian fluid, viscosity is a function of how fast they are moving. The faster they are moving, there are some which have a larger velocity, viscosity than when they are still or they have the lower viscosity. So viscosity depends on the velocity of motion. So I will be talking first about the uh, sub part, sub chapter of the physics of fluids which will not only be about the Newtonian, but also about what is called the ideal fluids. And ideal fluids are non-viscous. That is, when they move, they do not dissipate the energy. And with a, in a good approximation, the liquid which is, non, is ideal is water. But there is an ideal liquid in the world. And it exists, and it is very, 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 very useful thing. It's called the liquid helium. An isotope of a liquid, of a helium, a helium has three isotopes, helium-3, 4, and 6. The only helium-4 exists in the nature, and a helium-4 is a part, is usually excavated with the nature gas, so for years and years, the, essentially the only place where there was constant, considerable uh, quantity of, uh, of uh, helium-4 was Texas. In the Texas oil fields, they had considerable amount of helium. And now there is a competition. It's a, it's a, it's a very inefficient gas well, which is in Odolanov, next to Wrocław. And the Poland is actually a, a, a huge producer of helium. And uh, you can even see in Warsaw occasionally a huge truck, refrigerated truck, with the label Union Carbide, because the Union Carbide is, 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 is a company which excavates most of this, of this, uh, of the helium gas. And then it, it's transported in a liquid form. And the liquid helium is a very curious liquid. When you chill it below a 2.17 degrees Kelvin, almost very close to absolute zero, then all of the sudden becomes an ideal fluid. It's non-viscous. It, pro it, 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 pro it conducts uh, heat in a very unusual way, and so forth and so forth. And now we have a minuscule amount of all sorts of possible uh, ideal liquids. They are usually called ideal gases. They are, are cold gases because since 10 years, 20, 20 years, we can keep the small number, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 atoms of some gases like rubidium and strontium chilled to the temperatures we do not exist in the nature. They the, the, the fractions of a milli Kelvin, and then this object behaves also like a superfluid helium, and that's a completely new division of physics, which is uh, very important because there are dreams that it might be a good thing for our 
quantum computers which will change in the future. So the fluid is this, as an object which is described by uh, uh, essentially three parameters. The one of them is a pressure, and you know what is a pressure, it's a force per unit surface, temperature, and velocity, and, uh, uh, and uh, the density pressure and the velocity with which it's moving. These three quantities are called P, rho, and T, and when the fluid is not moving, then we the, the state of the system, complete description of the system, is possible using only these three quantities. The number density is the number of particles divided by the volume, and it's <coughs> measured in the unit one over meters cube. And what is more important, this for ideal gas, these quantities are related, and the pressure is equal to number of particles times the temperature times the constant, which I called R. And this is a universal gas constant. And that universal constant, I had written for you a, a definition of it. And uh, I, the only reason I have written that definition is that it exists in all sorts of books which you can read. But that is all old-fashioned, because two years, three years ago, essentially, and two years ago, completely, the units, the standard of units in which the physical quantities are measured has been completely changed. Now, we don't have any problem with defining what is a unit of mass and when you were in the school, you were told that there is a, such an institute in Paris, where next to Paris, where there are, there are standards of all possible units. Yeah, they are there, but they are not the standards of anything. It's a historical museum. We are now completely liberated uh, fundamental units used in physics from any physical object. The all physical quantities, all the units which are used in any science can be completely defined in so-called universal standards, universal constants of nature. And there are very few of them. This is a Planck constant, velocity of light, and uh, flux of magnetic field, charge of the electron, and there was no unit of mass. Until two years ago, the mass was still a block of a complicated alloy of a platinum, palladium, gold, and God knows what. And all that is gone because a certain individual had figured out how to replace the unit of mass by also a a combination of universal constants, and people have developed a, a, a physical device called Watt weight. It has nothing to do with the fellow Watt who built the first term, one of the first thermal engines, and that device measures unit, provides a measure of a unit of a mass by electromagnetic forces. And uh, what is very funny, that this device, when they published, that was done by the um, former American National Bureau of Standards, which is called National Institute of Science and Technology, which is the, the leading institution as far as that kind of research is concerned. And simultaneously with the publishing, the, how to build a new scale and how to make this experiment. They published a paper in which they show how to make that weight from the Lego toys, Lego chips. And we have in Warsaw the model, the, the weight working, what weight built up from the Lego chips made by the individuals at the Polish 
Gus, which is the Ujon Yari Shegon, and they built up that model, and something happened a few months ago, and it stopped working. Nobody knows so far why it has stopped working, but there's some, some problem with this. Either there is probably a wear off of those chips. I mean, after all, they are, they are on the, ch they, they are really chips. They purchase them in the store. They are not uh, anything specially made. And so there are various colors and there are these little, little humans inserted in <laughs> for fun and something like this. So we have the, uh, we, we, so this, this all is a historical, we have now uh, Avogadro number, which is defined as a unit, so we don't have any problems. And I believe we stop at this moment. We will be continue talking about the fluid next week. Uh, I like also to play a little bit of a games with my audience, teasing you a little bit. You, you must have remembered Archimedes' law. Right? Everybody remember that if you immerse something in the water, it loses the weight, right? Okay. There is a problem. This applies not only to the water, it also applies to the air. That's why the balloons are operational. So everybody knows in the high school how to calculate the Archimedes law forces, right? It's sufficient to calculate the ob vol ob volume of an object and how much liquid it expels and the buoyancy forces that the amount of liquid times the density of liquid times the gravity for acceleration, that's the buoyancy force. So now I have the question. There is, a, there is a balloon, which balloon, the skin and the container and everything, weights one-tenth of the expelled air. Okay, one-tenth of the expelled air. And it's attached to the ground by a rope, so it's standing and comes a naughty person and cuts the rope. And the balloon goes up. Since it was standing and now it goes up, it accelerates. So what is that acceleration? That actually might be also examination. Thanks a lot.